continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the M. Wiener Foundation of New Jersey, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the New York Times Company Foundation, and from the corporate community, Ruder Finn. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and today's program is one of an occasional series on what in the 19th century John Henry Cardinal Newman described famously as the idea of a university. Important then, this idea looms ever more challenging to Americans now as we prepare for the millennium. And my guest today heads a major urban university that notably in recent decades has focused on realizing ever more fully and well the core ideas and ideals upon which it rests. An historian by training, Dr. J. Oliva, is president of New York University. And I would begin today by asking him, what is the idea of a university that has informed NYU's rise to academic preeminence? Fair uh, question? Yes, a, a wonderful question. And, uh, uh, you mentioned Cardinal Newman, and, uh, and uh, just spoke with some of my Irish friends. I'm, I'm half Irish myself. Discovered that there's a movement to beatify Cardinal Newman, which I think uh, encourages every university president. I think great thoughts. Uh, the idea An example well said. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the idea of university, from my point of view, is is um, viewed in a very strange way by most people and, and I think the universities tend to push a mythology which is that universities don't change and that somehow or other there are a set of ideas embedded there for all the ages and our job is to protect them with our lives and uh, sacred honor but the truth is that universities have unfolded in, in rather astonishing ways since the 12th century and we all know that and, and uh, for example there was a time when medical schools were not part of universities I mean good heavens the university would have been outraged uh, by the notion uh, that there would be training physicians. How could that be? Uh, and that over time, uh, the notion of training clergy, for example, has given way to training elites, has given way to training everybody, uh, the movement to popular uh, involvement in higher education. And I think we're in one of those times when, you know, when the idea of university is shifting again very, very dramatically. And I'm not sure everybody gets it. As, as, as in most cases of transition, there are folks who don't get it. They don't know they're in transition. And I'd say that it's looking at those areas of transition that's most fun, to see how universities are really going to unfold in the next uh, millennium. It's time how do you, how do you identify those areas now? I, 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 uh, I can name some, but I'm not sure I'm smart enough to know what they all are. But I do know, for example, that uh, there is um, a growing um, a groundswell of sense that it is not a terrible thing to worry about how people will make a living. When universities were geared largely to elites and geared largely to clerical purposes, uh, folks came from environments in which they didn't have to worry much about that. And we got this idea that reading the great books was exclusive. And I think that's gone. I really think that reading the great books is enormously important. You've got to have a good life. You have to have an internal life that's full. You have to be understanding of, of the kind of culture that's around you. But it's OK also to say that in the course of my life, I'm going to have a career, maybe many careers, and that to worry about that and understand what those are, I think we're all into that. And parents probably represent that thrust the most, but universities who are thinking about the future really worry about that. I noticed New York Times articles now about placement offices. Who would have 30 years ago read stories in, on higher education which said, wow, look at the way X university handles its placement. Well, that is a small sign of a notion that um, life is composed of an inner life and a public life. And that the inner life is important, and we're going to read the great books and see the great uh, pieces of art and understand the great music. But we're also going to worry about how our public life unfolds, what it's going to be like. Yeah, That's but, one of them. Yeah, but isn't, before I ask you about others, isn't it also true that there are many who feel that with the emphasis on the dual lives, 
two lives, that one of them is being largely ignored, and increasingly it is the life of the mind. Uh, well, uh, there may be people who say that. I don't see that because uh, I live with students, almost literally live with students, and uh, I think that the life of the mind is, is alive and well. It really is alive and well. All that people ask is uh, that in the course of that emphasis, which we still are very, very strong on, the, the life of the mind, that uh, one take into account in an, in an open way how that life of the mind affects the public life. And, and I, I think that everybody that we admire in public life has made that connection. You know, all, all the folks that we would have said, I remember Adley Stevenson, so they'd say, what, what about Adley Stevenson? Where did he come from? And no one would have said that because he had chosen a public life, most public, uh, on issues that were rough and tumble and in the street, that that man was not living the life of the mind. So I don't think there's any great, if people want to say that, that's fine, but it doesn't, it's not a reality. Why do you call it a public life? When well, in I, a I, sense because, you're talking about private lives and how they make their living. Uh, I, I would say that I, I almost would, would push it to, to three lives because I, that two isn't enough. But when I, when I say the inner, maybe the inner life, which is how we develop ourselves and our appreciation of the culture in which we live, that's a very important kind of business. And our history, because I'm an historian, so it would be silly for me not to argue that history has lessons to teach internally, that to shape us as people. But then there's a notion that how much of my time am I going to spend in this world and what will I do with it? And the answer is almost all of us are spending an enormous amount of time in some public capacity. We are physicians or we're doctors or we're teachers or we're social workers or we're house builders or we're plumbers or we're carpenters, whatever, whatever that world is. That's a, wor that's a real world and it occupies an enormous amount of our time. And understanding how you want to approach that and how those choices are going to be made and, and for the university to worry a little bit with you about how that life will be shaped so that your inner life has an outer expression that you would like, that you would find ex interesting. But the third one is the one that, that I'm really emphasizing because it, it, it's also a new shape to the university, which is it's okay to worry about your inner life. And it's okay to worry about your professional life. But you also have to worry about how you live with other people. And we forgot that. Someplace at the end of the 19th century when it got complicated, and we didn't know how to, t and we, now we say, can you teach ethics? What are, what, are, what are the relationships of people to society? And universities backed away. They said, that's too hard. Why don't we just stick with, we'll tell you what books to read, and we'll help you to understand them. And then we'll explain to you how to get into law school, and you'll go. But don't get too much involved in uh, moral questions. Those shake the fabric of a very, very difficult uh, society, which is, com which is uh, uh, multi-ethnic. So how do we decide now? It's not like the 18th century in, uh, in the early colonies where we had a common shared experience. Now we have so many shared experiences, and they are spread all over the place. Let's avoid it. The truth is, the answer to that one seems to me that universities are now providing experiences for students and community service that is really quite extraordinary, in my own among them. And I lead one of those groups of people, who uh, students, about 400 of them, uh, uh, to provide students an opportunity to relate to the environment that's around the university as well as the environment that's in the university. And in New York, that means helping to tutor kids. Uh, helping to uh, in involve them, uh, and by the way, with whatever talents they have, sometimes it's playing the guitar, sometimes it's being an actor, sometimes it's knowing how to make movies, to, to, uh, to share the experiences they're having with people in the society who may not be ready yet to share that experience or want to. And so I find community service to be one of the great educational experiences. I'm, I'm old for this, but I'm coming to it late. Oh, I'm learning on. a lesson. Hey, I'm learning a lesson. And the students taught us. This was not a movement that started in Washington when Clinton said, let's have AmeriCorps and all the rest. It started with students coming to us and saying, I care very much about uh, Dante, and I want to read it, and I care very much about going to medical school, and I want to go. But I also want to know, how is your university going to help me to understand and play a role in the development of the society that's around us? There's a lot of problems out there. I'd like to have something to do with those. How are you going to help me to understand that? And how, in a global society, are you going to help me to understand why this isn't exactly life in Peoria, why, why this is different, and, and how I could come into contact with ethnicities and national aspirations that I wouldn't see there? It's part of education. So I think there's three parts. And uh, universities are changing in, in very dramatic ways to handle two of those. 
we, we know a good deal about uh, the life of the mind, as you say. Now to figure out where universities stand in relationship to, um, to a life's work and then to the notion of what do we owe and how can we learn about the society around us and how can we feel that our education involves also an understanding of the way the world's changing. Do you think that that third element is distinctive, not exclusively, but largely of New York University? No. I mean, I wish I could say, of course. I would like to say, of course, that's true. But no, because um, uh, I happen to belong, we have to belong to a consortium of universities and Brown University and Notre Dame and, and the rest, all are worrying about this in the most serious way. And if, I, if you said to me, is it easier for me to worry about it, then yes, it is. A large urban area. Be sure. And, and because I don't have to take students by bus to, uh, to an environment where they're going to... Uh, uh, Greenwich Village and, uh, and Lower Manhattan is one of those uh, wonderful places where America's being born all the time, where the city's being recreated all the time. So our students, I don't have to take them far. Uh, and to find a, a variety of experiences, but we're, we're by no means exclusive. You're going to find this a, a phenomenon of universities that, uh, of, I would say, wonderful universities that are looking to the future and saying, how do we respond to that request, that, uh, that their education include the education to difference? And so, no, we're not alone. By the way, we're very good at it, but we're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> how does that impact upon your relationship with the forces of government? Well, um, you know what I say, this is terrible to say, I guess, and in, in very direct, but um, it, it, it's good for the government to, tr to, uh, to uh, assist and provide resources and all the rest for that kind of experience to occur. But the truth is, we ought to be able to do these things ourselves. And uh, that what happens, uh, I, I remember a group of students coming to me and saying, and describing this community service and saying, do you, do you believe in that? And I said, yeah, I do. They said, then why don't you do something about it? You're the one who can raise the flag. I, I don't know whether you, you know where the Washington Square Arch is, of course. I do indeed. Up on the Washington Square Arch is, a, is, a, is a, the sayings of George Washington around the top. And uh, it was Adlai Stevenson's campaign. And I was just a student. I was watching this. And he, somebody said to him, why are you running? You're so far behind in the polls. Isn't this, I mean, I called out. You know, it's, it's New York. They ask you embarrassing questions. They said, what are you doing? And he, and he turned around. He pointed up to that uh, arch. And he said, uh, can you read what's up there? I said, don't know. He said, well, I'll read it for you. He said, um, it's George Washington at Valley Forge. It said, let us erect a banner to which the wise and the just can repair. The rest is in the hands of God. And I never forgot that. And what the students were saying to me was, raise the banner, and we'll, we'll, take, care, we'll take care of the rest. Your job is to raise the banner. So from, from, a, uh, from a real perspective, I'd like to say, yeah, the government should do this, and the government should do that. Uh, the AmeriCorps program is a fine program. It, it's it's uh, narrowly focused, doesn't have a lot of people in it. I have got four to 5,000 students, faculty, administrators, staff who participate in community service uh, uh, in very active and continuing ways. It isn't just something that goes around. And that's because we believe. I have an office. I spend money on it. I organize it. It is not, uh, community service is not feel-good stuff. It is, uh, when I first announced it, I thought, this is, hey, no big problem. Uh, until someone said to me, why don't you go in that room and help somebody to learn to read? And I didn't have a clue, not a clue, as to what, what's the first thing you do when you sit down with somebody. And so we've had, we've had to develop courses. We've had to develop support. Uh, I throw parties for the students who go out in the world because they need to come back and exchange those experiences and understand they're not the only ones having this problem or that they are not the only ones ex and, and having this uh, immense joy when little children want to see them every Tuesday. The reason that they would never miss a tutoring is because the students are desolated when they don't see the, the tutor arrive. All of that is organized. It's not feel good. It's not um, uh, given sermons. It really is organizing it. And so the government's fine, and, and, and I'm grateful for the things that they like to do. But the truth is, we don't ask the government uh, how to teach Latin. Uh, this is an area where we know uh, I've got all kinds of experts in educational psychology. I've got all kinds of people who can help students to recognize students that they're working with in the schools who have learning disabilities. They can do that. I, I don't need the government to do that. And politics? Uh, how does be, that be more specific? All right, be more specific, and that is, do you run into 
the problem of those who say this is politically charged what you're doing uh, and I'm not saying it is but I'm asking no no I, 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 I never anybody say that to me and uh, but I know but I know what you mean <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, if somehow or other uh, rather than help the, the the settlement houses where we my particular group does a lot of work with the settlement houses uh, Greenwich house a place for kids uh, it, we, we were we were marching around um, agitating here or there that somebody else should help them it's a very different that, that, now that, that's a means politics but that's not what's happening what's happening is that our students literally want to do what they can in an environment in which funds are being very largely withdrawn from very very useful programs and so I would say I understand that as a theory but it's not a real thing so that agitation isn't part of this it's I would say it. sure there are probably people who want to do it and will go and do it but the truth of the matter it's much more direct and uh, in an age when people say that this is Generation X and the students aren't interested in the world, hey, I, hey these aren't the students that I know. Okay, I wanted to ask you about that because it's so different. What you're describing Absolutely. is so different from the down look at the university. How do you account for that disparity? Well, because I think that um, uh, students are not um, great PR people. For and themselves. For themselves. And uh, w their interests are so powerfully individual that the, uh, joining a group and then getting your identity through that group is a lot less important than actually performing some very sad. And by the way, I would say a lot of students begin this with noblesse, which they feel that they are going to do something very, very good. For the, for the folks that they meet, and then discover. The person who's being changed the most is them, but that's education, isn't it? I mean, to discover uh, the impact on yourself that's occurring. But it's very individual and very powerful. And I had a, uh, uh, for our incoming class, I had a, uh, a uh, briefing session for our own seat team, and uh, we enrolled 300 kids. To, uh, to, to undertake those kinds of projects and uh, at all age levels and all kinds of varieties of things. And none of them said, can I put this on my resume or you know, am I going to get my picture taken? It wasn't, wasn't part of the game. And so I, I, don't, I don't know where Generation X is. I literally don't know. I'm a president of a university. He's got uh, 24,000 matriculated graduate and undergraduate students. And I don't know where that generation is. Well, you're not really talking about Generation X. You're talking about Y and Z by this I time, aren't so. you? Yeah, I think so. Thank God, because I don't, and I'm not sure, by the way, even in the past that uh, Generation X existed, but nonetheless, I think that, uh, that uh, in, in, in the world, uh, not in, in the rapid world of media, I think that things get picked up, taken, and individuals, small groups, can, can sort of set a tone when nobody else says anything. And uh, I think it, what the students were telling me was, you, you tell them. <laughs> yeah, if we don't have any PR representation and nobody understands how important this is in our lives, you tell them. So, they, hey, that's what we're doing. I'm telling them. Do they know that they're responding to John Kennedy's uh, Ask Not? What your country can do for you. I don't think so. I really don't. I, I mean, I wish, I wish that were true because that was a, a sort of magic moment in my own t development, maybe for lots of us uh, of that era. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think so. Uh, I'm... I'm uh, I'm astonished because I thought that I would spend a lot of time in the university um, getting students who are coming as freshmen used to the idea that this is a this is a uh, zeitgeist of this place. This is what you should be doing. This is the way you should be thinking about your education. Because there are people who said to me, if you really think this is serious, you should make it a requirement of the curriculum to do these kinds of things. And your response? I said, no, no, no way. I said, if if the environment can't be created in which and by the way, there are wonderful universities have all kinds of different environments, which when you join it, you sort of buy into that, into that world. And this is the one I want for mine. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't like the, no, the notion that somehow or other the, the, the coercion is going to take place and you will, because I thought that we could educate people and that they would enter an environment which they saw so many people doing that, that you would say, where do I join? And you know what? I didn't even have to do that. Because the, the the freshmen who are coming in are bringing it with them. I, I thought I would say this is the university will do what it has to do. It will implant this thought and it will uh, it will convince people that this form of education is very important. But I didn't have to do that. You mean to say when I ask you about the idea of a university, your response then 
is that the idea has been generated by the students who come to that particular idea we'd say that the, the, the notion of having uh, required languages and I don't think they generated that <laughs> the faculty generated that one well, what I mean is that there are forces at work in the in the alteration of the university that come from lots of different places some from the faculty some from the society around us and some from the students who come to us who tell us that education is a wider thought than we were accustomed to think. It used to be so much easier to think about education as, and by the way, it's back again, as stuffing people's heads full of things. And I'm scared about that in terms of new technology, which I think is changing universities dramatically too. And in that regard, instead of being very progressive, I find myself very conservative. Explain this. Well, well what I mean is uh, here, here I'm being told that uh, we can have distance learning, you and I will tune in to right. Channel 12. We'll have interactive relationship with somebody who's sitting in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment uh, 5,000 miles away. I will learn the elements of Japanese art. We will discuss them, and uh, that will be a new mode of, uh, of uh, interactive. Uh, that doesn't grab you. No, does it doesn't. It? Uh, it doesn't grab me because, and by the way, as a part, I think we're going. I, I, I was just come back from Mexico City where we're working with eight universities around the world to do just that but that isn't it that is the, that is the the uh, the factual sense side of the, of the business what america brought to this table which i'm not sure even cardinal newman you have to understand i went to catholic schools all my life so i grew up on cardinal newman i'm not even sure he got this the american version of this is also involves maturing it involves growing up. It's not just about the accumulation of information. It is a, an experience which occurs someplace between age 17, 18 on one end of the spectrum and 24, 25 on the other, in which almost everybody's half child, half mature. You don't know which half you're going to deal with at any moment, but it's growing up. And you grow up in concert with people who share experiences with you. And it's a, it's a sermon I give the faculty all the time and, and, and because I believe it. Namely, we are not just purveyors of information. We are people who are acting in loco parentis, not because we're enforcing rules, but because we're helping people to move from one stage of their lives to another, from one stage of relationship to a family and, and controls to another environment in which they are the leaders of the family, in which they exercise the controls. And in between are these years that we have responsibility for. And it's not just knowing the calculus that takes you there. It's, it's friendship and uh, role models and and share and and I think that uh, the American higher education system knew this all along I mean it's always been sort of that model of, of mr. and I hope Ms. chips out there who, who who spend their lives in relationship in this particular wonderful period of growth to help people come to a new sense of their own powers and their own maturity and you don't just do that by learning how to make the computer work. Well, it's clear. It's so I'm conservative on this one. Sir. <laughs> conservative doesn't sound like conservative. You're rejecting. You're a saying... A piece of what's coming. I'm, 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 I hope I'm rejecting the implications of what I hear, which is that somehow or other we will replace the meeting of mind and mind and heart and heart by a, a series of technical ability. Now, those technical things are wonderful. Even I know how to make a computer work now. What a surprise. Will uh, you show me, please? I'll, well, I'll try, but I'm not sure how far we'll get. It takes me 10 times longer than anybody. I can get where I got to go, but it takes me 10 times longer. And because I'm intrigued by the idea that a good deal of what we do, the, the, the technology can be wonderful. And, and I would prefer we're going to we'll be tied up with the Charles University of Prague and with the University of Florence and with the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And we will, I hope, do things for them that we we do well. Film is one of our great things. Why not? And that Mexican art will come to us uh, from Mexico and that the, uh, the wonderful anthropology and sociology of the Charles University will be available to our students. So I'm not saying that's not wonderful and advanced and it means that the faculty is a new thing. We want to see how you know, that's another point where universities are changing. The faculty used to be the people who could fit in the faculty club. The faculty is now anybody you want. In, in relationship to the kind of work you want to do, a global faculty, and how do you tie them to you in ways that will be so wonderful for your students. But that isn't all. 
That's a wonderful advance, but it's not the whole story. And so the only thing I'm complaining about and say rejecting is the notion that somehow or other all learning will be distance learning. And, uh, and that I hear people, they do, the, you know, the futurists, they say, well, you won't need the library and you won't need this campus at Washington Square or that uh, wonderful campus at Tulane or whatever. You won't, that, that's out. What you'll need is a nice quiet room and your machine and you will access the world. You'll be a very defective personality accessing the world. Yes, but do you think there will be all those defective personalities accessing the world, or do you think your point of view will prevail? Uh, mine will prevail, you know, and, I, and, I, and it's already, let me give an example. Uh, in a minute. In a minute. Very clear that when you do technical courses, place to place, you have to know the other person. If, you were, if you're in Mexico City giving the course, and I'm giving it with you, and I'm in New York, we already have had to have met. We already have to, had to agree on where we're going. We already have to be able to know what signals we're giving one another over this period, and the students have to know all of us. So we're going to see each other before this thing happens, while it's happening, and after it's happening. We'll get enormous benefits out of it. But well, it you will, are an optimist. You bet. You're hey. describing something that you say that's the way it's going to happen. I to think be. that's the way it's going to happen. And you don't think the machine in the garden is going to do a set. No, because remember 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they told us that it was coming and <laughs> what Charles happened? Charles Seatman at NYU was and what happened? Us. It hasn't. It hasn't. Because they forgot. Well, that I think... The human element dominates the whole business. It goes without saying that your idea of a university is one that I think we can all and would like to embrace, and I very much appreciate your coming here to the Open Mind to discuss it. You were wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levi. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you'd like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the M. Wiener Foundation of New Jersey, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the New York Times Company Foundation, and from the corporate community, Ruta Finn.